As has been pointed out in previous modules, most traits of interest in forest trees are quantitatively inherited. That is, they are controlled by many genes, each of which controls a modest amount of, vari of the variance in that trait. A gene that controls some portion of the genetic variance of a phenotypic trait is called a quantitative trait locus, or QTL. It is possible to identify QTL and their relative location in the genome by placing them on genetic maps. This is done by demonstrating a statistically significant association between the quantitative trait phenotype and one or more genetic markers already located on a map. QTL mapping is a powerful tool for elucidating the genetic architecture of complex traits and provides a clearly defined approach for marker-assisted selection in applied breeding or natural environment settings. We will identify the key elements of QTL mapping and give some examples of how it has been done in forest trees. Additionally, we will reflect on some of the limitations of the QTL approach using pedigree crosses. Most of the elements required to identify and map QTL are those previously noted for construction of genetic maps themselves. The factors that distinguish QTL mapping from genetic mapping are number one, the need for high quality phenotypes for all the progeny being genotyped, and number two, a different set of analytical tools. Let's quickly review the points noted here. Experimental populations. For the most part, pedigreed crosses such as those needed for genetic mapping are needed. For outcrossing trees, ideally, this means a three-generation intercross, though virtually any cross can be used, including open-pollinated crosses and two-generation pseudo-test crosses. You may improve your chances of detecting QTL by making the crosses to ensure segregation of the traits of interest in the F2 progeny. The size of the full sib family used is important. Studies have shown that 500 or more progeny are required to avoid bias in the number of QTL identified and the proportion of variation those QTL explain. Informative markers. The best mar markers are multi-allelic, co-dominant markers that could, identify, that could potentially tag as many as four alleles in the QTL. Generally, these will be the same set of markers used in making your genetic map. The map, a good framework map with enough markers, let's say 75 to 100, to completely cover the genome is desirable. Phenotypes, high quality measurements of the traits of interest are essential. One way to dramatically improve phenotypic trait estimates is to clonally replicate the progeny in the study trials. In effect, this results in an increase in trait heritability. We will leave comments on the last two points, analytical tools and verification, for later. Suffice it to say that what we seek are associations between differences in phenotypic means of genotypic classes evaluated one locus at a time. The subsequent effort to accurately locate significant markers is the focus of most of the so more sophisticated software. The figure at right illustrates the concept of what constitutes a QTL, as might be found in a three-generation intercross. Note that the deck is stacked, so to speak, in the grandparent generation. That is, crosses are made between parents that are contrasting phenotypically. For this example, we see that grandparents that are homozygous for uppercase alleles at markers across a given linkage group appear to be associated with small stature, and trees homozygous for lowercase alleles seem to be of large stature. The F1 offspring of this cross are intermediate in size, suggesting that the locus that appears to be affecting tree size must be exhibiting additive gene action. That is, heterozygotes are intermediate to either homozygote. 
In the segregating F2 generation, one can test mean tree size of all three marker genotypic classes to determine if they vary from one another. In this case, only locust B appears to show a relationship between tree size and genotypic class. The logical interpretation is that the locus affecting tree size must reside near the B marker. How close are they to one another? They may be only a few thousand base pairs apart, base pairs apart, or they may be a few million base pairs from one another. We can't tell the difference at this point. Remember from the genetic mapping module that mapping precision is largely a function of how many meiotic events you have to look at. As you will see, the confidence inter interval around the location of a QTL is generally quite large. Now imagine testing the genotypic classes of 75 markers spread across the genome for this same trait. You may find no significant associations, or many. Whatever your result, if you have done the experiment correctly, you can have some confidence that the result is a reflection of the real situation for that one specific pedigreed cross. This cartoon is a little more illustrative of realistic data that come from QTL studies. Again, the basic concepts of QTL mapping are shown here. For simplicity, this is illustrated using F2 offspring derived from the intermating of two inbred lines. In terms of markers, only three genotypes are possible, shown here as AA, AB, and BB. Markers can be widely interspersed since recombination will be rare in a single generation. Frequently, QTL studies are done with framework maps with markers spaced 10 to 30 centimorgans apart. Offspring are grouped by, their, by genotype and their phenotypes are examined for a significant difference among group means, such as using ANOVA, or analysis of variance. In this case, the AB heterozygous genotype is intermediate between the two parental homozygotes implying the QTL exhibits additive gene action. The distribution of phenotypes for the array of individuals with a given genotype clearly suggests that the effect of that particular QTL on that phenotype is relatively small, and that many other factors may be influencing the trait. Let's do a quick overview of QTL mapping. The idea is to find a statistically meaningful association between genetic markers and phenotypic traits, and to place the resultant QTL on a genetic map. This is done using one full SIB family at a time. To find an association, both the QTL locus and the marker must be heterozygous in the cross chosen. Imagine a trait that has a heritability of 0.5 and it is controlled by 10 genes, each of equal influence. That is, each gene or QTL accounts for 5% of the total phenotypic variance for that trait since half the variance is caused by non-genetic, or rather, environmental factors. It may be that the cross you are using is homozygous for 7 of the 10 QTL. In that case, you would only detect 3 of them assuming the power of your experiment was sufficient. Identifying and locating those QTL that are heterozygous in your cross depends on several things. Certainly, marker density is important, but not nearly so much as the number of progeny sampled for several reasons we have articulated previously. Early studies conducted with relatively few progeny, say under 100, were shown to overestimate the size of the QTL effect and to underestimate the number of QTL. As you might imagine, this problem increases as the size of the QTL effect decreases. While breeders had visions of identifying major genes with large effects, 
The reality is that we have found most trait effects to be very small, say less than 5%. QTL detection and estimation of effect size is also a function of a number of interactions between the QTL and other loci, that is, epistatic e effects, and environmental conditions. Finally, we note there are a few different analytical approaches to QTL mapping. We will spend the next several slides discussing each of these approaches. The simplest appro analytical approach to QTL detection is the single marker method, which, as the name implies, is a statistical test of the association between phenotype and genotype class one marker at a time. If you have 75 markers distributed over 12 linkage groups, you perform 75 different calculations. This can be done using simple t-tests or with very sophisticated analysis of variance models that seek to partition experimental variances as much as possible. That is, to remove non-genetic sources of variance. A statistically significant result is evidence that a QTL has a map location somewhere near the marker, though neither the distance to the marker nor the size of the QTL effect can be estimated well. It is not necessary to have a genetic map to use this approach, but having one greatly increases the amount of information available to you. There are other drawbacks to this approach. It does not differentiate between one and multiple QTL when they exist on the same linkage group. This may result in overestimating the size of the QTL effect. Conversely, the magnitude of QTL effect may, may be underestimated due to increasing, but unknown, recombination between marker and QTL. That is, the further the QTL is removed from the marker, the lower the estimated effect of the QTL. As noted, single marker testing is relatively simple and can be done with t-tests, ANOVA, or simple regression. However, it should be obvious that testing for a significant association be between discrete genotypic classes of many marker loci and quantitative distributions of one too many phenotypic traits can result in literally hundreds of st statistical tests. By chance alone, some tests will prove significant, yielding false positive QTL detection. Consequently, it is best to impose a correction for multiple testing, such as the Bonferroni, Sheffe, or other corrections of significance level available in most statistical packages. This may be done at the individual linkage group level or across the entire genome. The latter is the more conservative measure. In the figure shown above, which we will see again later in this module, one can see that 19 individual markers on a single linkage group have been tested for statistical significance. As is common practice, significance tests are defined by the LOD score. The LOD score, which stands for the logarithm of odds, base 10, compares the likelihood of obtaining the test data if the two loci are indeed linked to the likelihood of observing the same data purely by chance. Large, positive LOD scores favor the presence of linkage, whereas small or negative LOD scores indicate that linkage is less likely. A LOD of 2 suggests a probability that an association this strong would occur by chance alone 1 in 100 times. A score of 3, 1 in 1,000 times. With multiple testing, LOD scores higher than 3 are typically embraced. Here, only one of the 19 loci tested at the genome-wide level is considered significant, though it would appear that many of them are suggestive of being significant. More on this later. As Rebecca Dorge points out in the paper cited in the previous slide, single marker analyses investigate individual markers independently 
and without reference to their position or order. When markers are placed in genetic map order so that the relationship between markers are understood, the additional genetic information gained from knowing these relationships provides the necessary setting to address confounding between QTL effect and location. The interval mapping approach to detection and location of QTL was developed by Lander and Botstein to take advantage of this additional information. Interval mapping addresses the key weaknesses of single marker analyses using ANOVA. One, inability to accurately detect and locate a QTL. Two, inability to accurately estimate the QTL effect due to recombination. And three, inability to evaluate individuals for which genotype data may be missing. With interval mapping, each location in the genome is posited one at a time as the location of a single putative QTL. Generally, this is done by evaluating a somewhat relatively small region of the genome at a time, say two or five centimorgans, the distance chosen being somewhat dependent on the number of markers in your framework map. The process accounts for missing genotypes by using predicted genotypes based on knowledge of the parents of the cross being used and the other nearby markers. The statistical estimators in interval mapping are complex and have computationally demanding solutions. They often use maximum likelihood procedures. This figure, borrowed from George's, illustrates the principles of quantitative trait loci, QTL, interval mapping using linear regression and an F2 cross. An F2 population is generated by intercrossing blue and red parental strains differing for a phenotype of interest. The F2 population is genotyped with a battery of genetic markers covering the genome at regular intervals of approximately 10 centimorgans shown as colored bars on the chromosomes of the F2 individuals. Marker intervals are interrogated successfully, seen with the black arrows, for the presence of a QTL. For each interval and for each F2 individual, one computes the probability that the individual is homozygous red-red, that is, probability PRR, heterozygous red-blue, or homozygous blue-blue, using the observable, observable genotypes at flanking marker loci. The additive effect of a given interval on the phenotype is estimated by regressing the phenotypes on PRR, PBB, as shown in the panels on the right. In the absence of a QTL in the tested interval, example, interval 1, the regression coefficient does not deviate significantly from zero. In the presence of a QTL in the corresponding interval, shown by the star in interval 4, the regression coefficient may deviate significantly from zero. In this case, linear regression was used to determine whether phenotypes in each group are significantly different. Calculations can also be done using a maximum likelihood approach but maximum likelihood calculations are more complicated and linear regression approximations have proven to be adequate in many cases. Interval mapping is very powerful, providing good estimates of QTL location, QTL effect, and, depending on the experimental design and population, estimates of gene action. However, interval mapping may not effectively deal with the situation in which two or more QTL occur on the same chromosome or possibly on separate chromosomes. To do this, one must consider the potential effects of other genomic regions. Composite interval mapping was developed to better deal with such conditions. In this method, one performs interval mapping using subsets of marker loci, other than the ones being directly tested, 
as covariates. These markers serve as proxies for other potential QTLs to increase the resolution of interval mapping by accounting for linked QTLs and reducing the residual variation. The key problem with composite interval mapping concerns the choice of suitable marker loci to serve as covariates. Once these have been chosen, composite interval mapping turns the model selection problem into a single dimensional scan. Though composite interval mapping is still not without issues, it is much more robust to the existence of multiple QTL. In the situation where a single QTL exists in a given genomic region, interval mapping and composite interval mapping provide equivalent results. We return once again to this figure, which was borrowed from the dirge citation noted here. This figure is titled, Choices of Analysis for Quantitative Trait Locus Mapping. It uses data from an analysis of mouse chromosome 11 for the quantitative trait called severity in a study of experimental al allergic encephalomyelitis, abbreviated EA. E99. Microsatellite markers were genotyped in 633 F2 mice that were followed for this study. QTL analysis was carried out using QTL cartographer and several different approaches. Single marker analysis using a t-test, shown with black diamonds, interval mapping, shown with a blue line, and composite interval mapping, shown with a green line. The red line represents the 95% significance level on the basis of 1,000 permutations of the phenotypic data. The single marker t-tests identify one significant marker, D11MIT36. Interval mapping locates four maximum QTL locations on the logarithm of odds, or LOD profile. Composite interval mapping finds two significant QTL. The differences seen between the single marker analysis and interval and composite interval mapping are the result of information gained from the estimated genetic map. The difference between interval mapping and composite interval mapping is the result of composite interval mapping's use of a window or genomic region that allows other effects that are outside the window but associated with the quantitative trait to be eliminated from the analysis point under consideration. The benefit of de defining a window is that the variation associated with a point of analysis is confined to the QTL effects within the window and not outside the window, thereby reducing the effects of linked and ghost QTL. The result of composite interval mapping is illustrated by elimination of the two central ghost QTL. We should briefly address the, the concept of the permutation test here. A permutation test, also called a randomization test, re-randomization test, or an exact test, is a type of statistical significance test in which the distribution of the test statistic under the null hypothesis is obtained by calculating all possible values of the test statistic under rearrangements of the labels on the observed data points. In other words, the method by which treatments are allocated to subjects in an experimental design is mirrored in the analysis of that design. If the labels are exchangeable under the null hypothesis, then the resulting tests re yield exact significance levels. Confidence intervals can then be derived from the tests. The permutation test is an approach taken to define the LOD score for statistical significance when no other logical test statistic exists. A number of QTL detection programs have been developed over the years and they continue to add features and improve their algorithms for dealing with mapping concerns. Many programs were developed originally to deal with specific mating types, 
like inbred lines. One particular program was developed specifically for dealing with outbred tree pedigrees. It was eventually released online as QTL Express, though this model is now superseded by an array of analytical tools under the title of Grid QTL. We conclude the first half of this module with a few summary, summary slides without further vocal interruption. The concept of a QTL is not new. Sachs developed the theoretical basis for QTL mapping in 1923, and the method was first demonstrated in 1961 with bristle number in Drosophila. It wasn't until the recent development of plentiful genetic markers that renewed interest in the approach took hold, first in humans and subsequently in crops and animals. With increasing attention to the potential of QTL for marker-assisted selection and as diagnostic tools, we began to ask other questions, such as those noted here. Before moving on to address these questions, it is important to point out at the level of genetic resolution at which QTL operate. This can be done simplistically with the diagram shown here. Linkage mapping of QTL typically identifies one or a few flanking markers within a few to many centimorgans of the gene of interest, that is, the QTL. QTL discovery in pedigreed crosses will rarely, if ever, identify markers within the QTL or the QTN, that is, quantitative trait nucleotide, itself. Determining whether QTLs detected in controlled crosses are accurately located requires that you know what and where the actual gene controlling the trait resides. This seems to pose a bit of a catch-22, so to speak. However, in a small number of cases, the candidate gene has been identified, along with its location, and we can evaluate the accuracy of the technique. In the figure shown here, the position of a gene coding for a gibberellin oxidase, SD1, is shown for chromosome 1 in rice. The gene results in semi-dwarfing, or height reduction. QTL scans for plant height for from 160 recombinant inbred lines, or RILs, of the Bala Asusina mapping population of rice are shown relative to the position of the SD1, semi-dwarfing, locus. Bala has a mutant allele that maps to 176 centimorgans on a given known linkage group in this population. In different environments, shown in this illustration by different color bars, plant height QTLs explain 7.8 to 14.6% of the variation and peaks occur at 166, 171, 173, and 183 centimorgans with a mean position of 173 centimorgans. The LOD confidence intervals range from 10 through 18 centimorgans in width. As an example, for the drought treatment in blue, the blue broken lines indicate the generation of the LOD support interval. The position of the QTL obtained by combining all data across all environments, shown in orange, is 174 centimorgans, only two centimorgans from the strong candidate gene. In fact, 
for many crop and model plant species, the estimated QTL location rather accurately reflects the true location of the causal genes within 0 to 3 centimorgans. In each of these cases, a great deal of time and money went into identifying the causal gene so that these comparisons were possible. In some, but not all cases, the QTL mapping aided in locating the causal gene. For positional cloning approaches to identifying candidate genes, it is necessary to be within 0.3 centimorgans of the gene. This seldom occurs. Keep in mind that a centimorgan may contain anywhere from 100,000 to 1 million or more base pairs and host several to 100 potential genes. It is also important to note that the populations used for these studies lend themselves to accurate mapping. In outbred tree species, we simply do not have inbred lines or few known causal genes and genome sequence and physical maps that will allow us to make such determinations yet, but we do know from mathematical calculations that our confidence intervals around the estimated QTL are quite large, between 10 and 15 centimorgans. Though mutations in single genes have been shown to have very large phenotypic effect effects in some studies, as in Falconer and McKay, these are relatively rare cases and they almost always result in deleterious fitness effects. As tree scientists began their QTL investigations, they envisioned finding genes with major or moderate effect on traits of interest. For the most part, these were not found though the odd major effect gene has been found in QTL studies where hybrid crosses between two tree species were made. In the figure shown here, based on the accumulated results of 14 QTL studies in rodents, a broad distribution of allelic effects are noted, with an average effect around 3 to 4 percent. For conifer studies conducted with appropriately large populations, QTL effects for most economically important traits seldom exceed 5% for any given locus and average more in the 1-3% to range. Adaptive traits such as bud flesh timing or cold hardiness tend to have higher proportions of their genetic variation explained. Indeed, such traits also tend to have relatively high heritabilities. It is important to note that while single loci may explain only small proportions of the phenotypic variance of a trait, the accumulated proportion of variance for a trait based on all QTL detected may be substantial. We have briefly addressed the issues of the size of QTL effects and the accuracy with which they may be mapped. We would now like to talk about how many QTL are detected and how stable or reliable they are. That is, do the same QTL show up in the same populations in different years or under different field test conditions or for that matter in different crosses? In the next few slides we will describe a very complex set of experiments that attempted to address some of these questions. The results shown here reflect the efforts of many lab and field personnel invested over a 10-year period. The photo shown here is of a clonally replicated QTL trial containing some 450 individual progeny, each replicated 12 times via rooting cuttings, established on one of two field test sites, each of approximately four acres in size. As you can imagine, such tests are neither simple nor inexpensive to establish, maintain, and evaluate. We get, begin by describing the populations used for QTL detection and mapping. Much of what we have described in previous slides should be apparent here. This study used a three-generation intercross that began with four grandparents, 
that were selected based on the trait of vegetative phenology, that is, timing of bud flesh, a relatively important adaptive trait. F1 progeny of these crosses were expected to be heterozygous for genes controlling bud flesh. A single progeny from each of these crosses was selected and the two were intermated to produce segregating F2 progeny. The cross was made twice, once in 1991 and again in 1994 to produce independent cohorts. The first cohort, entitled the detection population, consisted of over 250 progeny. The second population, called the verification population, consisted of nearly 500 pro progeny. Both populations were clonally replicated and planted on multiple field test sites. In addition, the verification population was used in a series of greenhouse trials that tested for QTL detection under carefully controlled environmental conditions related to chilling hours, greenhouse temperatures, day length, and moisture stress. Population sizes shown here reflect fall down due to mortality and or missing genotype and phenotype data. For this experiment, 74 markers that were distributed across the genome were selected. This is equal to about one marker every 12 centimorgans. Depending on the cohort, this resulted in 15 to 17 linkage groups, LGs, which is a few more than the 13 expected. Many growth and phenology traits were measured, but our discussion will focus on bud flush a highly heritable trait in most trees. That is, heritability is about 0.5. You will see that bud flush was scored in field trials annually for six years. Most analyses were done with haley knotts multiple marker interval mapping approach, which is similar to QTL Express. Those single mark marker analyses were conducted to look at potential significant interaction effects. For those of you interested enough to spend time, there is a great deal of information to be extracted from this slide. The framework genetic map of Douglas fir is outlined in green with small lines indicating location of the 72 dispersed markers. The alternating green hues represent 10 centimorgan segments for each linkage group. An array of red and black lines and notations appear for many of the linkage groups. These are putative QTL detections for the detection and verification Douglas fir populations, respectively. Each of these populations was established in field trials in Washington, denoted by a W, and Oregon, denoted by an O. Bud burst along with other traits, was subsequently measured for several years. In some years, flush was measured separately for the terminal bud, labeled TR, and the lateral buds, labeled LT. In other years, it was simply measured as an average over the whole tree, which is denoted as FL for flush. Let's look closely at linkage group 4. There appear to be three distinct regions of the linkage group that possess QTL. These are located in the top, middle, and bottom for the detection population. Generally speaking, detections located within 10 to 15 centimorgans of each other are considered to represent a single QTL location. Each notation here indicates an independent QTL detection for a trait and year combination. An asterisk apply, implies significance, otherwise the location is only suggestive. A notation that reads 
WLT5 means that a putative QTL for lateral bud flush in the Washington test was found in 1995. That should help you identify most of the other notations except for those that denote interaction effects. For instance, OQY or WQY indicate a QTL by year interaction for the Washington or Oregon sites at that map location, and QS indicates a QTL by site interaction. Sites with many notations suggest a single QTL exists and that it is being detected multiple times. This is strong verification that the QTL is real. A smaller array of black notations represent QTL detected in the verification population. In the best of worlds, one would expect complete overlap between red and black QTL detections. Obviously, such is not the case. Fewer QTL were detected in the verification population. Given that the verification population was significantly larger than the detection population, the expectation was that more QTL would be observed there. How, what, how might we explain such unexpected results? Perhaps it was the environment of the study sites. The detection population in Washington State was established on a site very favorable to growth under mild conditions, which may have favorably influenced gene expression. What can we take home from this complicated illustration of real data? First, there appear to be many detectable QTL for bud burst trait, and they are scattered throughout the genome. Second, within cohorts, most QTL are verified by repeated detections over years and field sites. Third, between cohorts, verification of QTL sites was slightly less than 50%. Of course, this effect was confounded a bit by having two entirely new and different field sites at greenhouse conditions. So are all these putative QTL regions real? Maybe, but impossible to say for sure. What is clear is that even this mo moderately heritable trait appears to be controlled by many genes, each with modest effect. Oh boy, you say. I thought the last slide was bad. There is much more to talk about here also. So let's begin by describing the big picture. The authors have once again illustrated QTL detection for the trait bud flush, this time in three separate experiments, all conducted with the verification population of Douglas fir described earlier. These experiments, outlined in the earlier population slide, were A, row 1, greenhouse conditions with varying chill hours and flushing temperatures, B, row 2, potted outdoor trees grown under nat normal and extended day length and different levels of moisture stress, and C, row 3, planted field conditions at multiple sites. Now let's describe the illustration. Each row views the entire genome by moving from linkage group 1 on the left to linkage group 15 on the right. Colored lines are plotted F values with significance levels denoted by horizontal black lines for each of 15 linkage groups in Douglas fir. Different colors denote different experimental conditions as noted in the keys. Colored lines are a function of interval mapping approaches to analysis. Along the top line of each row, 
you will see letters and symbols which represent single marker QTL detection results including interactions. So what did the data tell us? First, it appears that often different QTL are expressed in different environmental conditions. This would imply that selection for a QTL in one environment may not be particularly predictive of outcome in another environment. Second, across experiments, at least two linkage groups, that is, groups 2 and 12, expressed QTL consistently. So, some QTL do appear to be relatively stable and reliable and probably represent relatively important genes in the biochemistry of growth rhythm. Also evident is that, even with these excellent studies and populations, interpreting the genetic basis of complex traits can be overwhelmingly difficult. And these results are for one cross only. How many QTL may exist for this trait that we're not segregating in this population? Let's look at one last Douglas fir QTL mapping slide to illustrate a few more points. In this partial map of three linkage groups, QTL are shown for bud flush and a suite of new traits, cold hardiness as evaluated by freeze testing in the lab. This was done both for spring and fall cold hardiness in cohort 1, the detection population, and for spring cold hardiness in cohort 2. Cold hardiness was done for three different tissue types, buds, needles, and stems. First, let's interpret the results. In cohort 1, it appears the same or very closely linked QTL for cold hardiness were detected for different tissues. Only one cold hardiness QTL detected in cohort 1 was verified in cohort 2. Finally, on linkage group 4, we see a rather strange co-detectant detection of 3 QTL for bud flush and fall bud cold hardiness. Strange in that it is difficult to explain metabolically. The second important point to make here is how QTL maps may play a role in identifying positional candidate genes. You will see on the map several markers highlighted by bold blue type. These represent polymorphisms in genes with known function as determined in other species. Many of these genes fall within the confidence intervals of the QTL shown here. Their known function indicates they could play a role in the phenotypes under study. Fine mapping with more markers and more progeny could better define the proximal location of QTL and candidate gene. But the process of chromosome walking to make a final determination is costly and time consuming and not always possible. The ultimate value of this technology is probably in identifying candidate genes for consideration in another type of complex trait dissection, association genetics, which we will discuss in the next module. This final QTL linkage map is intended to illustrate how well QTL are verified across genetic backgrounds. In this case, we are looking at QTL for wood property traits in loblolly pine. It is not terribly important what the specific traits are here. What is of interest is whether the same trait was found in different populations. We looked for these traits in two cohorts of the same cross listed as detection and verification populations in a related cross that had one parent in common and in an entirely unrelated cross. A couple of observations seem apparent. First, QTL for several traits seemed to co-locate in the same genomic region in more than one instance. 
This could be evidence of pleiotropy, or simply that we were measuring the same trait in different ways. Second, QTL detection drops off slightly for the related cross, but quite dramatically for the unrelated cross. To be sure, the latter was represented by a relatively small population size, but the implication is that QTL found in one genetic background are not necessarily to be found in another. This has serious implications for applicability in practical breeding programs. Let's take a high elevation look at QTL mapping and what we have learned by using it in forest trees. Undeniably, QTL mapping is an excellent method for identifying the genetic architecture of complex traits. It does so by conducting a whole genome scan for linkage group regions that are associated with phenotypic trait variation using relatively few and well-placed markers. Specifically, a well-designed QTL study can reveal, for one or more traits simultaneously, how many QTL exist, the location of those QTL, and the size of their effect. You can determine what type of gene action is in play, parental contribution of allelic effects, and whether QTL by environment interactions exist. For the tree breeder, they potentially provide a foundation for conducting marker-aided selection. And for those interested in functional genomics, they can identify positional candidate genes. Clearly, this is a powerful tool. In the next few slides, we will do a final dissection of the process. Twenty years ago, when we started the studies mentioned here, we did not know if trees had QTL, or if so, whether they could be detected. We now know they do. They have been found for virtually every trait studied and every species studied. The range and number of QTL detected per trait in our studies was typically between 3 and 10, but fewer or more occurred occasionally. We learned, in large part as a result of studies by William Beavis, that population size has a huge effect on the quality of a QTL study. Clonal studies improve the chances of detecting QTL by increasing the heritability of the traits studied. Our early hopes that traits would be controlled oligogenically or by few major loci were dashed, but we found that, at times, good studies identify many genes with large cumulative effects. Though dozens of QTL studies have been conducted in trees, only a handful have ever attempted to verify QTL in time, space, or genetic background. For those few studies that have looked at verification, some of which were reviewed here, a highly variable pattern of QTL stability and expression is observed. The results are at the same time encouraging and disheartening, particularly for the applied tree breeder. We conclude with a brief discussion of challenges facing those who wish to draw inferences from QTL mapping. As we have alluded to in this module, many challenges exist. From a practical standpoint, QTL stability is a major concern. For trees growing in highly heterogeneous conditions over decades or centuries, QTL by environment interactions appear to be significant. Coupled with our lack of understanding of pleiotropy and epistasis, this makes the predictability of QTL effects su suspect. But the single largest drawback to QTL mapping, from an applied standpoint, is the gen genetic basis for detectable associations between markers and phenotypes. QTL mapping relies on linkage disequilibrium between marker and QTL alleles 
generated by only one or two generations of crossing. That is, marker allele 1 may be associated with QTL allele 1 in the current progeny, but unless the two are very tightly linked, the linkage phase between the two may change in a relatively few generations. For that matter, linkage phase is almost as likely to be reversed in other crosses, simply due to the probability of a crossover event occurring between marker and QTL over many generations since the mutation first occurred. Though we have largely avoided discussions about linkage disequilibrium to this point, it will be a focus of the next module on association genetics.